Hi, it's Dr. Lori. How are you doing? I wanted to sit down with you and talk about buying and selling. I get questions from all over, all different social media platforms. I get questions from all of you for all different reasons. And I want to answer some of those questions so you can learn how to identify objects, bar- find the bargain, sell smart and make money, all of that stuff. So here's let's let me give you an example. And I'm going to answer these questions for you. So Should I ask for the old parts when I get a watch clock or something antique fixed or repaired? Yes, you should ask for the old parts. Now, some of you are going, what am I going to do with the old parts? Well, basically, if you don't get the old parts back, they might not, you may not have any way to know that they actually fixed your antique clock, for example. So yes, I would ask for the old parts back. If the clock doesn't work, then there's probably a part missing, right? (laughs) So I want you to have an understanding that, you know what, when it comes to getting something repaired, ask for the old parts. The other thing that people don't always realize is the old parts are actually valuable, just like the old parts on your car. So they're valuable too. So you could actually even resell just the old parts. Oftentimes people are surprised by that. So you're getting something repaired? Yeah, I want the old parts back. Most people who are legitimate, reputable repair people are happy to give you the old parts. They're doing it right and it'll be fine. So ask for them, yeah. Okay, what other questions did I get? Um, I bought an old Delft plate in Holland in the early 70s. It fell off the shelf and it's chipped. Well, you all know chips are bad, right? Okay, how do I find someone who can repair it in the United States? Okay, first things first, you can ask your local museum for a recommendation of a repair person or a restorer in your area. That's one of the good things you can do. Museums oftentimes will give that kind of reference. The other thing is before you get a piece repaired, you want to know what it's worth. Is it worth the cost of the repair? So some of you will say, oh, Dr. Lori, you know what? It's, it's family sentiment. It's sentimental value. I really, really want it. It's got to be repaired. It was grandma's. Okay, well, if that's the case, but if grandma's piece is only worth $50 and it's going to cost you $500 to get it repaired, how much sentiment is really involved? I mean, you know. Okay, so you think about that, but it's important to know that. How do you know that? Get an appraisal first. Also remember, when you're putting something into a repair shop, make sure that that shop is insuring your piece. If you have something very valuable, a valuable antique that's worth a lot of money, who's covering it while it's being repaired? Is that you or is that the repair person? So be aware of that too. Appraisals are inexpensive to get and appraisals are of course necessary before they go off to be restored or repaired. Okay, next question. Next question. Um, People will say to me, where do I find an appraiser? Where do you find an appraiser? I mean, seriously, I'm on a stage all over the country, two hours, I do appraisals of hundreds of objects and people still in front of me, in my audience, in person will say, how do I find an appraiser? I'm the appraiser. (laughs) It's not difficult, but I want you to get it, right? I want you to know that you're going to get an honest, accurate appraisal. You're going to get the information that you need to insure that piece or sell that piece or do whatever you want with that piece. Okay. Let's see, I, next question, let me do this. I recently got an 1880s antique book. I wanted to get it repaired, but I can't find anywhere near me. Do I, and I have no idea of an online company to send it away to. You should not be sending any antique away to anybody, not for repair, not for appraisal, not for review, not for any reason, okay? And I say it like that because this is the basic way that you never see your antique again. It's like stealing and you pay the postage. Don't do that. Never. And anybody who accepts or says they will accept their, uh, your object to review, to appraise, to restore is not the restorer or the appraiser for you. Okay? No, never. It's never a good idea to do that. It's my opinion. It's never a good idea to do that. And that opinion is talking 30 years in the field. So don't do that. Okay. I think you got my point. (laughs) Let's see. Uh, Next question. Next question. I have about 44 pieces of glassware. Um, I was told by our estate sale person that it's for Storia. Okay. The best offer I have while trying to sell it online is $60. And a potential buyer says he's questioning that it's for Storia. All right, so I got a couple of questions with this question. First of all, the estate sale folks. The estate sale folks, if they say it's Fistoria, 
they may know that it is Faustoria. Now, they have a job to do and you have a contract with these people. So their job may be to identify everything, right? Or it may be just to market and to run the sale for you and not identify anything. So it depends on what kind of deal you made with the estate sale people, it just depends. Now, I work with a lot of estate sale people, wonderful folks who in fact will have me do the identification and me do the appraisal values. And then they just run the biz, they just basically run the, the estate sale from your home that weekend. They market locally and that's what they do. So it depends. But if, the, if you are selling it online because your estate sale folks, maybe they didn't sell it or maybe for some reason something went wrong and this person is questioning the make, oh, I don't think it's Faustoria and you know it to be Faustoria, think about why this person who is trying to buy this object from you online wants you to believe that your object isn't what you say it is. This happens a lot. It's a tactic to discredit your listing online so they can get your object for a lower price, right? Oh, maybe it's not Faustoria, you start to think, even though experts have told you, yes, it's Faustoria. So this is what they're trying to do most of the time. The, alter the ulterior motive is usually not something where they're going, oh yeah, we want to help you and we just want to tell you what you've really got. Usually they're trying to discredit your listing. So again, if you're not sure, ask me. Next one. Hello, Dr. Laurie, I had a water pipe bust in my, in my house. All of my Lexington wicker furniture was ruined. Well, you know, that's just a shame, right? And that's why you need the insurance oftentimes for these pieces. But I have a full set of this furniture. It was in perfect condition. It doesn't matter if it was in perfect condition. It's not in perfect condition now. <laughs> so, but uh, it's going to get moldy. And in order to get the correct amount back from the insurance company, so this person had insurance on it, that was good, I need an appraisal. Okay, so now this person asks, is it even worth it for me to get an appraisal? Now, I think this is an easy one. Why? And you're going to say, well, you're going to say to get an appraisal. Here's why I'm going to say to get an appraisal. If I wasn't an appraiser, I would say to get an appraisal. You've been paying the insurance premium on that for all these years. Now, of course, tragedy strikes, the pipe bursts, and now you've got this situation where, oh, uh, I'm going to lose all the money that I've been putting out of the insurance premium, paying that, and also the money in the object itself. Of course, you need to invest in the appraisal. The appraisal, of course, you can get an appraisal for many different amounts, right? But basically, if you get it from me, you're going to see sales records where similar pieces sold. And again, the insurance companies have different standards that have to be met when you are making a claim. So, they, and insurance companies don't just take appraisals from anybody. So you have to, of course, have an expert like me to give you that insurance appraisal. If you've already paid for the insurance, you've already paid for the, of course, fixing of the pipe and all the rest of this, and you're owed the value of that ruined set of wicker, well, you know what? I would say it's worth it to invest in the appraisal. Get your money out of what you've already really paid for in insurance. That's what I would do. Okay, next question. Dr. Lurie, um, you're so knowledgeable about antiques, it's very nice. How do you know, how do you not go broke when shopping at thrift stores and estate sales? Well, this is about budgeting. This is about time and budget, right? So you've got to stick to your budget. You go into that, that thrift store, you've got to make sure that you make your, whatever your budget amount is, you know, last. And you have to also know how to identify the best pieces in that thrift store so you're not spending too much. So what you are spending on, you're making, of course, a good deal every time you spend on it. I always say be polite and negotiate. People will say, oh, you know, no one wants to negotiate. People will negotiate typically. Be polite. Use cash if you can. And if you can't, you know, of course, you can always again, group items together. I'm gonna to buy five items instead of just one item. You should get a little bit something of a discount for something like that. But basically, it's all about budget and it's also about correct identification of the object. Once you learn what to look for in that thrift store, you're not gonna buy the very inexpensive or very expensive and high priced stuff that isn't going to either decorate your home the way you want it to look or again, flip it for more money. So those pieces that you can pass by and not waste money on the stuff that you can't flip for a good return. All right, let's see, where else are we? Um, I've been watching your videos 
Um, I've been watching your videos. I'm always excited for your Sunday videos. I really am grateful for all of that. I'm very happy that, that you're excited by the videos and that they're helping you and that you know you have a source, you know, who's fun and also who's, of course, giving you information you can use. Would you ever consider putting out two videos a week? Well, the question I'd have to ask you is, because this is about budget and time too, would you, be, would you consider us paying a small subscription fee for multiple videos by me every week? Small, not a lot. So basically that's one of the things. And of course it has to do with budgets, time here, has to also do with, of course, the folks who help me to make all of this happen. You know, of course I'm fabulous, but you know, you do need help. So you need other people who are of course involved in this process too. I have a very good team, couldn't do it without them. So having said that, it says, I've been watching your videos on your community tab and I have to say you look great. Oh, well, uh, I have lost some weight. My struggle has always been my whole life, my weight, very, very difficult for me. They finally found out what was wrong and I am fortunate that I've been able to figure this out with doctor's help. So I'm happy about that. But thank you for noticing. It is difficult. It's a big struggle, but it, it's what happens. What are you gonna do? Um, I, have, I will say that I miss a lot of my favorites, <laughs> like chocolate and wine. Anyway, um, next one. Next question. A seller on a selling ha app is tooting that um, she actually sold something that I think is, that this person who's writing in thinks is fake. So she thinks it's fake and that she's very upset, this person, that she sold these pieces anyway. Okay, so somebody actually sold something that this person writing in thinks is fake. All right, so what do you do? Who do you tell? What do you do, right? So. A couple of things. There's a lot of misinformation out on the internet, right? There's a lot of people who use misinformation as a tactic. So it's a tactic. So now you have to see who's really doing this. Who's actually the person who's using the tactic? Is it the person who actually is asking the question? Is it the person who is trying to sell this object? Was that person legitimately thinking that she had something or he had something that was authentic and it's not what what's happening here so you have to think about the misinformation it's all about sources and you're hearing a lot more about sources now aren't you my whole life has been support your evidence in your paper with a source right so sources to me you've got to make sure that the sources are correct but what ends up happening a lot of the times with sources is there are some underlying agendas with sources what does that mean well so this goes on to another question so Basically, what happens here is I've had some people who have said to me, you know what, um, I've called some of these auction houses or I've called some of these sources and in fact they say, oh no, what's posted on the internet isn't correct, right? But it's posted there as an authenticated sale, yet it's not really correct. Oh, we don't really sell that. So they, once you talk to these people in person, they say, oh no, well what's online isn't really right. Well. Okay, so now why don't you want to sell my object that's like the object that's sold online? You know, a piece of furniture, say it's a Duncan Fife sofa, right? Well, it says that your auction house or your dealership or your, you know, or your eBay store or your whomever sold one of these, right? Just like mine that I want to sell, right? And basically it says that you sold it. It says that you sold it for X amount of dollars, but I'm calling you and now you're saying, no, we never sold anything like that. Why is that? Do you not want to sell mine? What's your agenda? So you have to think about the source and you have to make sure that there's some, do you see some reason? Or is it that, well, we got the one from, that we sold online, you know, we really got it for a song and you obviously know how much yours is worth and we don't want to pay you what you want for yours, right? To resell it. So you have to think about what the agenda is with these sources and you have to think about authenticated sales records. You know, you don't want a sales record where somebody lists an item and then they have their brother buy the item for, from him, show as if it's a different email, right, online, and then basically it sold for this astronomically ridiculous amount of money that none of other objects like it sell for. So you have to really see what the agenda is and what the source is. I try to identify those for you so you know what misinformation is. So you understand that. And the best way to understand that is to know what you're selling and to know the market for those items. What else have we got? So you have to know your, your pieces, for example. 
And then I get this question, I get this question a hundred times a day. My kids don't want any of my dishes. My kids don't want any of my antiques. So let me ask you this question. When you were your kid's age, did you want your mother's stuff? No, you didn't want your mother's stuff, right? What's interesting about this though, your grandkids probably want your stuff. And people go, oh, my grandkids. I didn't ask my grandkids. I only asked my daughter or my son and they didn't want it. I have, can't tell you how many grandmothers I've talked to who have, are in big trouble with their grandchildren because they just bypassed them and they just gave something away once a daughter or son said, no, I don't want it. The other thing I have seen after almost 30 years in this field is in fact that a lot of folks don't realize that these particular pieces are valuable and a lot of people don't realize that your kids have to get to a certain age before they typically want your items. It's usually, you know, sometime late 30s into the 40s once their careers are established and their kids are, are on their way, elementary school age and such, that these children really say, oh yeah, mom, I wish I had your canister set or, you know, the lamp in the den that dad used to read by or whatever it might be. So remember that as well. You know, you have to sort of come of age a lot of the times. But when it comes to nobody wants it, let me tell you something. It's not unusual that at first glance, a child will say, no, I don't want something. Also because many of them are trying to be respectful and not take all your stuff. So you have to think about that as well. Your grandkids, don't forget them because a lot of the times they want them and they're not always asked. I'm Dr. Lori. I hope these buying and selling tips have been helpful to you. Keep watching and thanks for watching.